Contrary to popular belief, life in South Africa is not that different from other places in the world, including the US. Ask anyone you may know that toured South Africa in the past and they will tell you the exact same thing. It basically also means that you will find your timid Christians and your more fundamentalist Christians scattered around the country. White people make up roughly 15% of the population of South Africa. A large contingent of white Afrikaners is resident in the north of South Africa. They are predominantly Afrikaans speaking, with Afrikaans being a language that resembles an evolved form of Dutch. Some are very racist, and almost all of them are extremely religious. You find them all over South Africa, but they are very concentrated in the north. Imagine the USA Bible Belt, and you won't be far off with a picture in your head. I was raised in a house where it was expected of you to go to Sunday school. It was a surreal environment though, as my parents rarely went to church themselves and never proclaimed themselves to be born-again Christians. Religion was never a topic of discussion in the house. Both my parents cussed like sailors, my dad could drink like a fish, and all in all it would be safe to say that religion was never really at the forefront of any decision making in the house. The only time religion would become part of the discussion is when the topic of sex outside of marriage came up. Seriously, it was that trivial. But, I never doubted that both my parents were believers. Part of the reason it may never have been discussed is because it is just naturally assumed over here that everyone believes anyway. So who cares about the nitty gritties, right? Well, I did. I was taught that there is a God. Jesus died on the cross for us. We celebrate his birthday at Christmas. There are ten commandments which says you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain and you may not kill or steal and then there were some others. It was only as a six year old in Sunday school that I was taught all the stories of Jonah and the fish, the birth of Jesus, his crucifixion, etc. Each Monday morning school assembly started with the singing of the school anthem, the Lord's Prayer and a religious message from a designated teacher. In Sunday school I was taught about Adam and Eve and I distinctly remember that it didn't sound right to me. Two people populated the earth? But if I'm not allowed to like my cousin, why was it then allowed for cousins to have sex for eons at a time until the earth got to be as populated as it is now? I heard the story about Jonah spending time inside a whale and living to tell the tale. At that time I have had extensive experience in cleaning out the entrails from fish that we caught and I just knew there was something wrong with that story. For years I sat in church services, bored out of my mind. Then I sat through Sunday school and that bored me too. But the Sunday school camps were the best ones ever. They were cheap as they were partially funded by the church and conservative parents saw it as an easy way to keep their kids on the straight and narrow. Well, just let the church do their thing. At one particular camp, I remember that guitars got hauled out one Saturday morning and what followed was a lengthy praise and worship session. At first there was one girl that broke out in tears. Then it spread to the kids to her left and right. Then to the front and back. Before I knew it, I was crying too. The entire hall was filled with sobbing children wanting their God to cleanse them from all the wrongdoings and save them. I felt God's presence in that hall that day. I had no doubt anymore that God was real. I still couldn't believe everything that was written in the Bible. But I made it easier to digest by acknowledging that humans wrote it and they are just as fallible as I was. I went home after that camp and proclaimed to the world that I'm a born-again Christian. It felt good to say it. I was never again going to say or do anything that could be classified as naughty, as it would be flying in the face of what God wants me to be. He wants me to be perfect in every way. He wants me to be His child, and I wanted to be His child. Then one tiny slip-up happens, then another. 
Before you know it, your life is filled with guilt over a cookie you took from the tin on top of the fridge or the cuss word you used in frustration after someone bullied you at school. The only logical thing to fall back on was prayer. Praying like your life depended on it, because it did. Asking forgiveness for everything you think you did wrong, for the things you know you did wrong, for the things you think others may think you did wrong, and last but not least, for everything you have done wrong but have forgotten about. God, you know everything and remember everything. If there is anything I have forgotten to ask forgiveness for, please forgive me for everything I have ever done wrong. The motivator for making sure you are forgiven for everything? The fact that you just don't want to spend an eternity in hell. As time went on, my born-again status became less of a badge of honor. It lost its initial luster. I just resorted to prayer to keep things straight with God. Ask and ye shall receive, right? So ask for forgiveness and it is wiped clean. That was easy enough to maintain, until I started feeling stupid for sending these air telegrams into the night sky every night. As a child I had a fascination with the stars and the planets in our solar system. I devoured any book aimed at kids and teens that demonstrated certain scientific experiments, gave me examples of ones I could try out myself and taught me things I never knew before. I sat for hours watching shows about animals, astronomy and science in general. The first time I was exposed to evolution the topic just made sense to me. It happened instinctively. I could look at fossils and find similarities between them and other species of animals before it was even pointed out to me. I became fascinated with watching primates interact with each other and seeing certain behavioral traits in them that we, as humans, also possessed. Unfortunately I was trapped in a life where I had to face up to diversity on a daily basis. And no matter how strong and resolute I tried to remain in the face of it, I always just instinctively knew that God would have my back when I can no longer stand up to it myself. I prayed to God regularly, and every time I did that I felt silly for doing it. But if that God existed, He would know that I had doubts about His existence, so I developed a prayer to counter any ill feeling God may have towards me for having doubts about His existence. It went something like this. Dear God, you know my heart. I almost never do anything to deliberately harm anything or anyone. When that happens it is not because I wanted to sin, but because I felt like it was the only thing to do in the moment. Seeing as you know my heart, dear Lord, I would reasonably assume that the evil in this world would be far more deserving of your attention than my petty transgressions. If there are anything I have done wrong in your eyes, Lord, please hear my plea and understand that I deeply regret ever disappointing you. Please forgive me for everything I have done wrong today. Seeing as you have a plan for me, I could only assume that the hardship you are making me face is supposed to make me stronger. If you are merciful, as the Bible say you are, I would like to ask from you that you ease the suffering and pain I have to endure by helping me out every now and again, just to be sure that you also have my interests and well-being at heart. And then insert request here. I can count on one hand the amount of times any of my requests were met favorably. And it took many years to pass before I came to the realization that those granted wishes was because I made it happen by vocalizing my desires and then acting on it in isolation. During my final year in high school, my faith in the existence of a God feigned. I subconsciously started to live my life as if one did not exist. 